Good evening, and thank you so very, very much for letting us such a warm reception. Uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for you to just sit back and relax while I take you on a brief journey back through history, if I may, and hopefully give you some insight into the history of a people, my people, African American people. But before I do that, I'd like to, number one, let you know how I became a collector of black memorabilia. For a very, very long time, uh, I had no interest in it. And I became a collector, actually, by accident. I sometimes refer to myself as, as a accidental collector, and sometimes I refer to myself as a closet collector, because I'd buy a piece, bring it home, and put it in a box in the closet. And somehow that box would fill up, and then another box would get started. And um, I really wasn't aware that I had a master collection until I was asked by a friend of mine that uh, owned an antique store down in the Los Gatos area, down in by San Jose, if I would do a presentation for a class that she taught at one of the local colleges. And when she asked me, I told her, my answer at that time was that I would think about it. And the reason that was my answer was because back at that particular time, these items were not as out in the open as they are today. And I wasn't really sure what type of response I would get if I did do a presentation on it. So I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And finally, I started to dig these items out of the different boxes that they were in. And I had them all lined up there in the kitchen one day, and I pulled up a chair and just kind of stared at them. And it was as if these items stared back at me. Now, I refer to that time now as a what you're going to do stare down, because that's basically <laughs> what it was. Uh, and I um, decided, really, at that moment, as I, as I looked at them and looked at their faces, it was as if these items all had a story to tell. And so I decided at that moment that I would help them to tell their story. So I'm going to get started, if that's okay with everyone. Now, the very first item that I can remember getting or acquiring was this little six inch uh, wooden ruler. This ruler has the name G.A. Morgan Hair Refining Company on it. And I actually got this by, um, I guess you could say accident or as a freebie. I had gone into an antique store and I had made another purchase and the lady just kind of threw this ruler in as a freebie. So I took the thing home and I, um, took the item that I was most interested in out of the bag, and this thing was at the bottom of the bag, and then I took it out and I kind of looked at it, and it said, here, we are everything in hair. We are the only colored institution that owns our own building, chemical lab, printing office, and machine shop. We manufacture all of our own products. Well, that made me kind of interested in who was the guy. I had never heard of him. And so I started to do some research and as I did the research, I found out that Mr. Morgan had been quite a guy. Uh, the first thing, he owned a sewing machine company. And he was one day looking at the uh, sewing machine as it went about its work. And he was looking at a needle. And the needle, the friction from the up and down movement of the sewing machine uh, caused it to singe the, the material or the fabric that he was going into. And so he decided that he would um, try to invent, uh, come up with a solution that would stop that problem. So one day as he worked there in his shop, he um, took some of the solution at the end of the day, and there was a woolly type fabric that was laying over to the side, and his wife called him to dinner, and he picked up the fabric, wiped the solution onto the fabric, and he left there for the evening. Now, when he came back the next morning, he looked over at the fabric, and the fabric had straightened out. And he made note of that. Now, another day, as he was working there, he looked out the window, and he saw his neighbor's dog. And the dog had a hair, hair kind of like an Airedale, very tight, curly hair. And so he signaled for the dog to come over. He said, the dog came over. And the, he, he took some of the solution, rubbed it on the dog, and the hair of the dog straightened out. And uh, when the neighbor came back, the neighbor didn't even recognize his own dog. This dog was had straight hair now. And so he then applied a little bit of the solution to his own hair. 
first in a very small portion and then to his entire head. And when he did that, it straightened out his hair. And thus, Mr. Morgan had actually um, come up with a solution, the very first hair straightener. Now, you may not think that was such a, a big thing, but it, it really, for me, it became something that made me more interested in him. So I dug a little bit further. And Mr. Uh, Morgan, his name is actually Garrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T, -T, Garrett Morgan. And he, um, one day was working in his shop, and he invented a mask, which was called the safety hood at that time. And um, in uh, one of the towns, the town that he lived in, I believe it was the, the um, state of Ohio, they had, it was in 1916, and they had a very big explosion in a tunnel. And a lot of people actually would have died had it not been for Mr. Morgan because there were people that were trapped there and they couldn't get out and they, people couldn't get in to, to save them. So they had heard of, of Mr. Morgan and, and this, this safety hood. So they got him and brought him down telling him to bring his hood. He brought his hood down. He and his brother went into this hood, into this tunnel, and they stayed, they, they stayed in there for a while, but they came back and they had survivors on their backs. And then they kept entering and bringing out people. Now, they didn't save everybody, but they saved a lot of people. And he actually invented the very first, what is now known as the gas mask. Now, the, the, all of the firemen and the police departments and, and, and all of these people, they saw this hood and orders were flooding in. But when they found out that Mr. Morgan was a black man, they canceled their orders. So Mr. Morgan had to and have a white man to impersonate him so that he could sell his product. So I, I, I kind of thought about that and I thought, wow, you know, I, again, I had never heard of Mr. Morgan. So I dug a little bit deeper and I found that he invented something that every one of us in this room probably will use when we leave here tonight. And that is the traffic light. And I did not know that. He actually uh, invented the, the, um, the stoplight and he sold his patent to General Electric for $40,000. So that was the beginning of my digging for uh, information about black people because I had never heard of him, nor had I ever heard anything or been taught anything in the history books about Garrett Morgan. So I'm going to start um, again by posing a question to the audience, and it's interesting the answer that I get when I ask this at different presentations, is who do you think is the most um, uh, well-known or famous African-American female? Anybody? Oprah. Yeah, those are the answers I normally get, that, that a lot of them say it's Oprah Winfrey. <coughs> I heard somebody say it's Condi Rice, and then it's depending upon which age bracket in the audience, they'll say, one young girl said, why, it's Janet Jackson. And I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I would uh, beg to differ with all of them. The answer really should be that it's Angie Mama. Angie Mama has truly stood the test of time. She uh, was actually a living, breathing human being. The very first woman that uh, had the job of Angie Mama was a woman by the name of Nancy Green. Nancy Green actually traveled the countryside, making her mouth-watering pancakes uh, at the Chicago Expo and county fairs. And she had a little saying that she had as she would set up her booth there. She'd say, hi, in town, honey. And in town, indeed, she was. She made over one million pancakes in her time. Now, uh, there have been several women that have held uh, the position of Angie Mama, but she was, uh, Nancy Green was actually the very first. Now, if you were to look at the image of, uh, if you looked at uh, one of the images on, say, this box here, you would see uh, here the picture of um, an ancient mama that has more of the look of a slave. They have the bandana or handkerchief, uh, and most of them had aprons, and, and, and this is a very old box of pancake mix. But in the midst of the civil rights movement, uh, uh, ancient mama started to transform. She lost the scarf. She was given a nice white pearl earring, a nice white stiff collar. Why, she even lost weight. So, uh, <laughs> she, uh, she made quite a transformation. Now, 
A lot of African Americans feel that Aunt Jemima should have been retired a long time ago. But uh, they feel that Betty Crocker was retired, so why not Aunt Jemima? Now, I would be remiss in my duties were I to speak on Aunt Jemima and not uh, mention her, her friend Rastus, the cream of wheat guy. Oh. Rastus was a real person also. And um, Rastus was actually discovered in a Chicago restaurant. And he was discovered by a man by the name of Colonel Mace. Colonel Mace spied the handsome young gentleman and thought that he would make a wonderful image to have on the front of his product, Cream of Wheat. Um, the company spokesperson said for a very, very long time that nobody really knew the identity of who Rastus really was. And it was said that Colonel Mace and Rastus <coughs> had a secret way of identifying each other were there to ever run into each other again. Now, whether that was a secret handshake or a secret code, nobody seems to know. And he, he, he remained a mystery, really, until 2004, which is very, very recent. And uh, the, he would have remained a mystery had not the genealogical society in the city of Leslie in the state of Michigan not started to do a little bit of a study and work to find out exactly who Rastus was. And they believe that Rastus is actually buried in their town in an unmarked grave, a cultural icon in an unmarked grave in their town. Now, the last I heard, there was a movement afoot to get a headstone for his grave. Now, whether that has actually happened, I don't know. But uh, Rastus did not really forego as much uh, transformation as Aunt Jemima did. This is a very, very old box of cream of wheat. And here you, you see him, and he pretty much looks the very same today. Um, but he has been on the front of that box since the 1900s. So the next time when you hop into your IHOP restaurant for your Sunday morning fix of pancakes, you may want to give a wink and a nod to both Aunt Jemima and Rastus, because they truly have stood the test of time. Now, the other thing that I would like to talk about in, in regards to these items is that these um, cookie jars, a lot of them um, have been made in the image of mammies. As you can see here, the, they, they have the bandanas. This is a very, very old McCoy cookie jar. And it would take me probably, that would be something that I'd have to do a workshop on, and that is... Uh, African-American memorabilia that's being reproduced. If you, if you actually look at the jar here, this, this one is very, very old. It is McCoy, and this one is the most reproduced one of them all. But if you were to say, I want to collect black memorabilia, then you, you look at that and, and you have to learn how to um, identify um, which ones are reproductions and which ones are not. And the one way of doing that is to look at the dimensions of a real one, because the ones that are being reproduced are just slightly smaller uh, in size. And, uh, but the people that are making them now, um, they have perfected right down to the sign of it. Like this one under the bottom will say by McCoy, you know, because that's the company that made these. But, the, the people that are reproducing them now, they, they are also signing them, of course. And cookie jars, very old ones, they start to get what they call crackling. And if you look at them, the, the people that are, are doing them over again now are starting to <coughs> perfect the crackling. So if you, are, uh, if, if you learn how to identify these types of things, you'll see uh, the real from the fakes. And believe me, there's a lot of fakes out there. And not just in cookie jars, all the way down the road. They are, uh, and, and the, the bottom line on it, I think, it, it's money. It, it's money and plenty of it. So uh, that is why I believe that is being done. A lot of these items, uh, they, in the 60s, they, they had, you know, the civil rights movement and all of that. And so these things disappeared. But suddenly in the 80s, they sprung back to life. As I studied these items more, um, I became um, kind of interested in 
how a lot of these things came about. And the, it was as if, I think, prejudice, thoughts, and all of these things were pretty much taught from the cradle to the grave. From the time that um, they got up in the morning, they um, pretty much would have breakfast with they put the seasoning on their um, eggs with the um, Aunt your mama salt and pepper shakers, and or they would have um, pancakes made from by looking at a box there that had uh, the image of a servant, uh, or of course the the cream of wheat box. Now there is one other thing, and I don't know where that is. Uh, I wanted to show you the linens, and that we evidently didn't get that out here. But um, there are tablecloths, there are. Um, drying cloths, all of these types of things that are made with the image of African Americans on them. And the odd thing about it is that none of them were made by African Americans. So um, uh, when, I, when I get down to that end, I don't know which box it's in, it's probably still it's here somewhere, but I'm not sure where. Um, the, uh, the one thing, like I said, is I started to study these items more. I, I looked at the, the way the prejudice ideas and thoughts, like I said, it was from ba basically cradle to grave. You uh, would tuck your children in at night and uh, read them um, stories from very, very prejudiced books. Uh, Uncle Remus, um, Little Black Sambo. Um, I looked at um, Huckleberry Finn. And the N word is used in Huckleberry Finn over 200 times. And uh, these were the, the stories that um, a lot of people um, basically read to their children at, at night. So it was from sun up to sun down that, that basically that the precious thoughts and ideas were put into the children. Um, Sambo, which is, uh, and I don't know how many people really remember um, Sambo's restaurant. How many do? Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Sambo's restaurant was basically <laughs> was put out of business uh, pretty much because they started to have problems and then in, I guess it was the, I want to say it was 1980. I, th I think they're down, they were down to one restaurant, the original, and that was in Santa Barbara, but I don't even know if they're still around. But some kind of way, they, they got connected to the name, they, they had the name of Sambo, and Sam, the name Sambo is kind of like a racial slur. So you certainly, in the, the 60s or 70s, you wouldn't want to be sitting in a restaurant with the name of Sambo on the front, and I think that's what kind of helped to take them down. There's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Here is Agatha Christie, a book by her, and um, she chose to name her book The Ten Little Inns. And everyone knows what the inn is. But uh, this, that is what she's a mystery writer. And um, a lot of these, uh, these, these types of item, items were out there. And if you look at a lot of the sample um, items, you'll see that they always show the African American with derogatory facial features. The uh, oversized lips, these are nice, actually missing the tooth, and you've got the bugged out eyes. Um, and no matter how the games were played, the African American always lost. I don't care whether it was, you see some of the games, uh, I've got so many of them, I couldn't bring them all here, but the children are being chased by alligators. They are always uh, in a crisis type situation. And uh, in this particular game, uh, this guy here, you, they, they're bean bags, and you throw bean bags, of course, at the target. Um, so it was, it was things like, here's another, The Adventure of Little Boy Sambo, um, and he's here facing the tiger. Uh, so no matter how the game was played, the African-American person always lost. So uh, that, that was something where it always showed them as, as being the, the butt of the joke or whatever. And um, here are some games. Um, in, in the, as the 60s came around, things started to change and they started to make games that were a lot more positive. This is one of the negative ones. This is one that's called snake eyes. And again, as you can see here, they have the exaggerated facial features, the uh, oversized lips, and the, the guy and then the, the woman has the, the bandana scarf tied on her head. 
uh, inside of here is a deck of cards, and um, you can see, um, well, I think, I, I can't remember which one it, 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 it's in here. I believe it's one where she's, she has the look of a mammy. Uh, but anyway, this is one of the, the, the negative games. Um, then, this game looks pretty mild, and it's, it's cute, and it's called tap -tune. And I thought, wow, that's cute, you know. And so, uh, when I was going through it, you have a, a little xylophone and a, and a stick, and you can, the kids can play with the stick and feed on the xylophone. Um, until you get over into the game, and they have a lot of, the kids could color uh, the pictures and, and uh, trying to find one in particular here that, um, it looks pretty, like I said, it looks pretty, pretty mild. And And then you find this one. And it says, the sun shines bright in my old Kentucky home. Tis summer, the darkies are gay. So they are making, again, referral to, to the, the color. Um, but these were the games that, um, that the children played with uh, during that time. Now, when the Civil Rights Movement came about, they started to make um, more positive games, such as this one. They, Famous black people in here, of course, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, and there were a lot of games after that that, uh, that became more positive. But if you find um, a game that was, oh, I don't know, I'd say back in the 1930s, somewhere in there, you find a game that shows an African American in a positive light, you've got quite a treasure because none of them ever, ever showed in that light. Um, these guys are uh, cookie jars, and as you can see here, this one has the name right on her, her tummy here. It's in Mammy. Um, I don't know why you have to exactly have a Mammy. I think you can see that by the, the image there that she has. Um, another uh, way that uh, African Americans were shown is that in just about every product that you can think of, uh, that is the way African Americans were uh, were, were um, uh, proceed. Here is a um, paint, and it shows a black man. Uh, he's in the chair, and he's getting his, his tooth pulled by the white dentist. And you drop your coin there, and he pulls the man's tooth, and the black man falls back and falls out of his chair, and the, the dentist goes in the opposite direction. So there's a lot of companies that made iron banks. But uh, none of them ever showed, uh, again, showed the African American in, in a good way. Now, this particular bank is called the Jolly Nigger Bank. And if you look at him closely here, he, he has, of course, the exaggerated facial features. And you, you put a coin in his hand, and you pull the lever, and his, his ears wiggle and his eyes roll back. He's actually eating the corn. Um, there was a, a lot of companies that made uh, banks that, that were like that. Um, not only that, there were, I don't think there's probably anything that, um, I can't think of a product that they did not uh, make that they did, you know, that did not show. This, this particular company, um, it was a tobacco company, and they chose to name their product Nigger Hair Tobacco. And um, they, they sold this product for uh, a very, very long time. It's actually uh, a pill. And uh, they, uh, they chose it, and then they have the, the, the graphics here with the, the guy with the ring in his nose. And you can smoke or chew, it says here. Um, Patent Office, April. I guess it says April 3rd or 8th, I'm not sure, 1878. Uh, I don't know whether this company, uh, for whatever reason, whether they found that that name was too offensive or exactly what happened. Later, they made the chewing tobacco and they called it, they changed the N to a B and made it bigger hair tobacco. So I'm not sure why that was, except to tell you that the graphics didn't change. 
the, the guy, the, the, the person you're on the front is the exact same, same company, same everything. But maybe they took a lot of heat for the name. I don't know. But uh, they did change the name. Or maybe they just didn't feel right about using the N-word. Um, uh, this guy is uh, a humidor. You put your um, tobacco inside here. And, uh, but again, uh, uh, African Americans were seen a lot uh, with hugging watermelons or eating watermelons, being chased by alligators. And um, that is what this young boy is doing. He is, it's like his love for watermelon, you can see. No, no matter how these items were made, they usually always showed the individual looking happy. They were always usually smiling or, um, or happy, as if they were always happy, as you can see here. See this guy smiling. All of them are always smiling. This guy right here, I don't know if um, how many people really know about him, but he was very, very controversial, and um, mainly because um, it, it, there's two sides of, of history or two stories that actually go with him. Uh, there is a, most of them that I, that, that you find are usually about this tall. And if you are from the South, you used to see these, these statues on the lawns of uh, a lot of uh, very prominent homes in the South. Uh, this guy is called the Jolly, I mean, I'm sorry, it's called the Jocko statue. And um, the story that actually goes with him is that the, uh, General Washington was going to cross the Delaware River and go over and fight the British. And um, it was a very, very cold night. And there was a young boy that was 12 years old that was with him. Now, this little boy wanted to cross the river and go over and fight the British also. But General Washington deemed the little boy to be too young. And so he told the little boy to stay on that side of the river and to mind the horses and to hold this lantern so that they would be able to see how to get back across. And so the little boy did as he was told, and uh, General Washington went over, they fought, and then they came back. They saw the lantern, they came to the little boy, but when they got there, they discovered that the young boy had frozen to death in the icy blizzard. And General Washington was so taken by uh, what had happened that he erected this statue. Um, in honor of the young boy. Now, there is another story that follows the Jocko statue also, and that is that this uh, statue was also used during the time of the, um, the runaway slaves. And uh, supposedly, this statue was on the lawns of very, very prominent um, homes. And there were some white people that were uh, very sympathetic to the, the plight of the uh, uh, black people. And, um, and so they would actually help them. And they would have this, this, this guy hold a lantern, actually. He's supposed to hold a lantern, the larger ones do. And um, they would leave this lantern lit. And that would tell the runaway slaves that there was a white family there that was sympathetic to their cause and that would help them out. And so, uh, or would hide them. And if the lantern was lit, it, it meant that there was a family there that would give them shelter, give them food, or whatever it was that, that they needed. If the lantern was not lit, then that meant, you know, to keep going. It wasn't safe to stop there. Um, and so it was, it, it was called the Underground Railroad, for those that are, are, are familiar with that. And the Underground Railroad, uh, it had no train, it had no tracks, but it ran as efficiently as our BART system and rapid transit systems do today. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sheet music. <laughs> okay, time wise. Okay, um, sheet music is um, something that it, most of it, uh, I would say, was derogatory uh, towards blacks. Um, it's kind of like um, if you find a piece of sheet music that was made in the earlier earlier years. Um, you, and, and it showed African Americans in a positive way, you, you really do have a treasure because the majority of, of it did not. Um, they would uh, 
it was always usually in a comical way or uh, well again it, this guy here is playing the, his trumpet but again you can see he, he has the exaggerated facial features and um, there are others that um, say like this one is called Strutter's Ball. I'll be down to get you. Everyone probably knows the song. I'll be down to get you, honey, in a taxi. I'll be down to get you in a taxi, honey. Well, but as you can see, the, the, the guys here, the, the men and the women, uh, all have, and, and, and I guess they're dressed appropriately, but they all have the exaggerated facial features. Uh, this one it shows a black uh, woman or mammy, and she's uh, saying that they made it twice as nice as Paradise, and they called it Dixieland. Um, here, uh, the poverty rag. It shows a family, and that, that's something that you uh, rarely see. When you did see a piece of sheet music that uh, showed a black family, it was always um, in a derogatory way. Um, the, there's the, the father. Um, and all of the children, and the wife, she looks very, very tired. <laughs> she looks very tired here. Uh, but they were always shown, and in a, this particular piece is called Poverty Rag. So it shows them in, in a very, very um, bad uh, or uh, not um, flattering way. This one is Goodbye, Elijah Jane. Uh, and again, the exaggerated facial features. Now, the, uh, this particular uh, piece, I think, is, is quite interesting because it's called the War Bride Blues. And it shows the black man going off to war and his uh, wife, or uh, I said bride, so I'm assuming that it's his wife. Um, the company that made this particular piece, um, they originally named it Nigger. War Bride Blues. And for whatever reason, I'm not sure why, um, maybe they took some heat, I'm not sure. But bottom line is, they eventually, they changed it to just plain old War Bride Blues. Um, there were others that, that, that had no problem in using the N-word, as you can see here. Um, lots of sheet music. Uh, lots of sheet music. Uh, is, that black, is that black man on the front or is that black no. face? Yeah, black face. Black face. Um, <laughs> This, he's actually a white man that uh, is impersonating uh, uh, a black man. Um, and this particular piece is, um, they're using the N-word again, N-word, N-word, never die. Now, th this one is kind of interesting, I think, because, and I, and I have several pieces that are like this. This is actually a supplement to the San Francisco Examiner. And this was uh, one of the newspapers that, that's still around today. As far as I know, I know they're having problems. I don't know if it's still around or not. But th th this was a supplement to their, their newspaper. So um, as you can see, it was, it was prominent in, in just about everything. And uh, it, there were some, there, there's some sheet music that's positive. Uh, well, I say positive, so I mean, they didn't use the N-word. Uh, but the majority of the time, the, uh, the majority, they always showed um, African Americans in, in a way that uh, was not very positive or flattering to blacks. Now, African Americans have made a wonderful contribution to the world of music. And here you will see uh, the way it started out. These were seven, the, the old 78s. And here again, you, you see the, the, the young boy with watermelon. And uh, they were always uh, depicted with watermelon or possums or some type of animal. And as you can see, this is an uh, older piece, of course, uh, with the young boy. And it says here from, at the bottom, strictly from Dixie. <laughs> and then you had, um, this would also be 78. Um, Bert Williams, this was a black man that performed in blackface, and he took a lot of heat for that. Uh, but uh, he, he was able to do it, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of blacks did not like the fact that he performed, in, a black man performing in blackface. 
Now, as time went on, things started to get better for, for African Americans, and you started to get the more positive, um, like uh, Louis Armstrong, uh, more, more positive images. Um, here, uh, an evening with Belafonte. Uh, it, it started to, to show them uh, that uh, uh, black people could be seen in a positive light, like Nekin Cole and uh, a lot of other uh, individuals. So um, it, it was, uh, it, it's things like this that um, I think that if, if these items really should go around uh, to schools and, and let people see how it was back then. And uh, from a historical standpoint, I think that it's, it's something that really should be seen. Um, the uh, one thing I want to say at this point, and then I'm going to open it up to questions, is that I, I really appreciate you guys having me in. And I hope that um, in the, the very, very near future, hopefully in my lifetime, that people will start to see people for, not for their color, but for, as the late great Martin Luther King said, for the content of their character and not the color of their skin.